this is God of the Old Testament, and everybody gives, you know, he's a, a supposedly the God of war and everything. Well, there was a lot of war because he was establishing a nation that would bring the seed into the world, who was Christ, that would be the savior of the world. Uh, you remember whenever, and a lot of people say, well, that Bible is bloody and terrible. When they attacked the Melkites and they killed everybody, and God told them, told them Saul to kill them all, all, every one of them, yeah. women, children, their beasts, everything. And people say, oh, what is this? Well, I'm not saying that was a fun day, it certainly wasn't. <coughs> but you got to know who the Amalekites were. Specifically, Amalek. Amalek. You know what he did? Not so so. They were, when they were coming out of Egypt, now God, God fully intended to use Israel as his wall against the work of Satan in this world on the earth. And he's going to use the church as his wall in heaven. And we do, of course, have an effect while we're down here. But Israel was a, it's much more physical. The swords are not spiritual like ours. You know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal as far as fighting the spiritual warfare we fight, but the spiritual warfare they fought was physical, swords. Okay, so Malachi gets this bright idea as they're come out Amalek, he ends up being, I saw a lesson on him one time. I'll read you that. It's a good lesson. Teach you a lot of things about the devil. Uh, he was the devil card at that time. What he did when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, all right, in the back of the train of all of those people, you had the infirm, you had crippled people, you had the children. The children. That dude sat in on them and just killed them by the thousands. Okay? And God gave them, believe it or not, he's a gracious God. He gave them 400 years to repent of that. They never apologized for Israel. They killed off the older people, the infirm people, people that were crippled. And the children coming out of Egypt. So, when he makes Saul king, he says, You go and you take care of that business. They're not going to repent. He gave those people 400 years. Now, why was the attack so physical and so cruel and so hard? <clears throat> because God's plan for Israel is different than God's plan for the church. They will yet fulfill that. There will be nations that bow to that nation. And whenever he's getting all that thing together, that, that's just one little thing I wanted to get off my chest because you're going to run into people. Now, as far as Aaron, I don't like that idea. But I do understand why it happened. At least we can understand why some of these things happened. Those children were killed. But you know what the parents were doing to those kids? The parents, Amalek, the parents, were burning them alive. Oh, my goodness. Okay, as a sacrifice to their God. <laughs> and they'd take them and put them in a pot. Uh, that's gross stuff. But they'd take them and put them in a little pot, like a, we would think a flower pot, and then put those newborn babies, shove them down in there, and bury them in the cornerstones of their temple. Uh, so, they weren't, you know, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> But that's the way it's always put some kind of a light like a modern day. There's nothing modern day about it. They were cruel and mean people. God said, wipe them out. So don't tell how many babies escaped the fires of Amalek. Amalek, remember that name. We'll just study on him. You can study, you can understand things about the devil. The devil changes anybody. He takes on several forms. And that's something we need to be able to look at too. But these things here, I'm just driving up to see my grandbabies. And uh, I, I just, you know, I put in Bible times. And I listen to Deuteronomy a while. I listen to Genesis a while. There's some things got on my mind from Genesis too, as well. I got so tickled in Genesis when Brother Ronnie, whenever Jacob finally caught up with Esau, <laughs> and he sends all, he's, he's scared of Esau. First of all, he saw a promise to kill him, you know, because he stole his birthright. And he sends, first he sends the, the, the camels, and I mean the little sheep, and then some goats, 
And as the thing is getting closer and closer, Esau is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and there's uh, donkeys and camels and then children and then people and families and women. And <laughs> he was going to, he was trying to give gifts to Esau so he wouldn't kill him. And <laughs> Esau said something. It struck me funny. I can't help it. I'm going to read the Bible. It struck me funny. He said, what meanest thou by all this drove? <laughs> it's, just, it's just funny to me. What do you mean by all this, Jacob? I mean, God. He tried to give it to him after that. And he said, no, 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 I don't need it. I've got plenty of wives and goats and stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was funny to me. But Jacob had worked himself up because he had lied to his brother. Don't you find it interesting that he had lied to his brother and stole his birthright? Then he goes and works for Laban for starts for seven years and Laban lies him. Mm -hmm. He says, "Okay, you can work for Rachel. Rachel must have been pretty respectful country because he was really in love with her." And Leah was, the Bible says, a soft-eyed person, so she was probably pretty too, but not not didn't strike his fancy like Rachel. And he worked for him seven years. And he worked for Rachel for seven years. Well, after the seven years, Laban pulls a fast one on him and gets him leaving. Well, God's in all of that. But here's, so Jacob got back. Jacob was gotten back for being a deceiver. That's what the word Jacob means is deceiver, grabber, cheater. Okay? <clears throat> and so he got it back in spades. Uh, and he was scared to death of Esau. So, all of those stories. Now, listen to this deal. The whole Bible would not have turned out like it would have had Laban not deceived him. You know why? Leah's fourth child was a young boy named Judah. Judah had never been, if Judah had never been born, Jesus would never have been born. He was of the tribe of Judah. So you see, God's working this out. He's got such a wonderful sense of humor. I mean, some things in life aren't funny. I know they're very tragic. But God, I, I just thought that was so funny. That was so funny. What do you mean, what do, you mean by all this stuff you bring it out here, Dan? Out in the middle of the desert. But anyway, now this, this just struck me as an odd thing. Turn with me to, or let's look it up. Whoever can find it first and read it. Deuteronomy 20 and verse 7. One of the oddest things I've ever found in the Bible. But it shows me something about God. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. And that's exactly what happened. He gave the law the second time. Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 7. Exactly what, what man is there that hath betrothed the wife and hath not taken her? Mm -hmm. Let him go and return her to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. Huh? Let's look at that. To me, that shows you something about what God. He cared about that young man and that young woman's relationship. Enough to work. This is all in the context of laws in times of war. That's what it's in the context of. So a man is there that has to draw the line. In other words, he's engaged. Engaged to be married and have not taken her, so they haven't consummated their marriage. Let him go and return him to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take him. Does that not show you something about the nature of God? Yeah. To me, but I had never thought about it in relation to romance before, for lack of a better word. I had never thought about it like that. <coughs> So he was concerned about it. Here's another one. Deuteronomy, a little more detail. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 5. Go. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war. Then shall be he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up, but shall cheer up his wife, which he did take him. And we're reading this out of the Bible. Doesn't that strike you as to the personality of God? 
He has that young lady's well-being at his heart. I don't want to see this like that. I thought it was the most amazing thing that's eat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's about God. You know, we have, whether we like it or not, we have some preconceived notions about what God likes and dislikes and sees and doesn't see. He sees it all. He knows you can really like it. Don't, doesn't that bless you? We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. But I think that's just amazing about God. They always talk about the Amalekites, but they never talk about the Romans. The, the whole idea was protect that nation. Protect that nation. Why? Funerals. All of the things that are bad in this world began being reversed when Jesus died on that cross. So he, he puts these things, I believe, in the Bible to help us understand that he understands. He understands our dream. He had to turn his back on his own son on the cross. But what I'm saying, what Jesus began, he upset the entire apple cross. In heaven and earth, he upset it. Um, what began there at the cross will consum consummate one day in our glory. And you'll hear these people say, well, that's it. The deep six, the people, that's the end of it. There's nothing beyond the grave. Hogwash. Thank God there is. Christ reversed that process. He knew. He knew. But he's just. He had to proclaim justice in the Garden of Eden because he told them if they ate of that tree, they would die. If he did not fulfill his word, then it wouldn't have been just. But he know what that no more gets out of his mouth in Genesis two than he has Genesis three already in place. In other words, he made a plan before he ever even put him on the earth that he's going to have a way for us to escape. People may not like to escape, and I'm not saying that some of these things aren't tough. You know, people want wisdom. You want wisdom? Well, I tell you, some of the toughest things in life what gives you wisdom. And wisdom's not necessarily a happy place to be. When you, you, you've gone through some of these things with the Lord, and you've suffered through some things, and you go through these things, even when you're a child, you, things happen. But you begin to understand that the Lord has a way made to get through that. And ultimately, all of us will have our new bodies, and we'll be running around heaven and once a time. Now, but only do the one thing, what Jesus Christ did at that cross. What he did at that cross was reverse the thing. Okay? That's why all the miracles he did, he showed them his power. All the miracles he did, raising people from the dead, that's all to illustrate to us that everything that God has said. Now look, <clears throat> sometimes as a man, we second guess God. Try not to do that. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Someone you love dies, that's hard. Or some other thing comes up. Your truck gets burned up in the middle of the field. <laughs> you know, that's painful stuff. But God's got a blessing. I told Harrison this morning, I said, well, the devil threw you a curve. I said, if the Lord's going to hit a home run, you just watch what your next vehicle looks like. He's going to get it. He's going to bless him. Why? He's following him. He trusts him. All right, enough of that <laughs> preaching. Poor old Harrison, I've been in his ear again. Oh, um, I just wanted to share those two things. Does anybody have anything you'd like to share with us? Something you were reading in the Bible this week that may be different or surprised you a little bit? <clears throat> I've got some things lined up for this period of time in our uh, having to do with missions. I think you will enjoy it. I think you will enjoy it. Um, We'll get some facts, and we'll also have a little bit of there'll be a little bit of entertainment in there. You'll see what I mean. But I, I ordered some things from the. You've heard of this organization with on the Mars. Uh, if you can get that book sent to your home, it will encourage your devotional life to Christ. I guarantee you it will. So you'll see some things in that Voice of the Martyrs, Bartlesville, Oklahoma. 
Can you imagine? I thought, brother, it would be Chicago, Illinois or something. And I looked at that and I had the word from Bartlesville, Oklahoma. I said, well, that's where those two guys made that Heineken. There's some kind of beer over there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> My mind works in funny that's ways. Funny. I remember that. <laughs> Not good, preacher. Okay. Yeah, I've got one that confuses me a little. You read something? Okay. Just in the past, I've read that. In the concerning, past. Concerning marriage. Concerning marriage. That divorce, if you will, only came if she was found to be. I can't hear you. Divorce would only, was only permitted if, if the lady was found to be maybe an adulteress. Or a man. Or a man. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Now you're talking about the law. Yeah. All right, and you have to be real careful. Here. Well, that's where God. Okay. God talked about right. marriage. Right. You know, right. Twenty-four verse one. When a man takes a wife and marries her, comes to pass he finds no favor in his eyes, because he found some uncleanness in her. Mm -hmm. Then he'll write her a bill of divorce and give it to her hand and send her out of his house. Mm -hmm. Or Galate. Law now, you're talking about the law. Yeah. We're talking about a, a nation that God is building to bring the Messiah from. But I just, I guess I don't quite understand. If he was engaged to her and he found out something about her, just as Joseph did with Mary, well, Joseph was married to Mary though when Jesus was born. But he chose not to put her away. Right. Well, if he found Still some, all. if he found some uncleanness in her, what kind of uncleanness would he have to find to divorce her? Still law, and it meant uncleanness. If she had a mole, I mean, you know, she had a veil, and she had a mole. He didn't like it. Bye bye. But Jesus told him. He said, God didn't plan that that way. He said, you boys just did that. Put her away with a bill of divorcement. Okay. On those kind of grounds, there are three reasons for divorce in the Bible. Number one's death, of course. Number two is, and here's one that's not taught, desertion. Okay. And the third one is adultery. There are not just two reasons. There are three. And in teaching those three, a minister must be very sensitive and careful because there's no law on it. There is, we are under no law. <coughs> we do have grounds for divorce under those three reasons, but they have to be administered in a Christian way. And in fact, Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 7, 8, and 9 deals with that and actually the Christian parent has a choice there. But the ideal is what Jesus said. One man, one woman. That's the ideal in the Bible. Now, lots of times it doesn't work out according to the ideal. That's why we take the time to talk to young couples and, and work with them. There are ways to maintain that ideal, hopefully, and help with those different things. Sometimes help cannot arrive. So remember those three. I'll teach more on it, but you've got to be very astute with your Bible. Yeah, I mean, you need to be astute before you start teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Mm -hmm. Now, you need to know exactly. Now, here's the problem. What's the problem with it? Paul didn't write about it very much. So there's a lot of things you have to ascertain through the spiritual leadership of the Spirit in your life. He didn't write about it very much. They wrote to him and asked him, apparently, in Corinth. But he doesn't go into great detail. Let me see if I can give you 
Let, let, I'll show you how this can be difficult. And navigating it takes uh, cross-referencing, a lot of cross-referencing. You do need to know what's under the law um, there. That's very good to know because Jesus used it to help people understand about divorce. And today in his spiritual ministry from the heavens, he still wants us to be aware of it, but not practice it. All right, I mean, uh, let's see here. Let me show you some of the things Paul talked about. Uh, marriage. Look in 1 Corinthians 7. I'm going to have to hurry through this. I, you know, I, I, I apologize. I'll do this quickly. Because yeah, it's always hard. Anytime there is division of any kind in the life, it's never easy. <clears throat> never. Just like them poor folks at their house burned. Folks, that's a divorce of the kind. I mean, their, their lives will never be the same. All right. Defraud ye not one another, except it be for consent. This is within a Christian marriage for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. This is in case of uh, uh, the husband and wife really want to seek God. See the assumption in this. The assumption is that you're seeking after spiritual life. Now, some people want a catch-22 so they can say, well, I'm right, she's wrong, she's wrong, I'm right, uh, I'm right, he's wrong. Don't. There's no catch-22 with this. There is none. We're not under the law. All right, we're led by the Spirit, Brother Ronnie, and there are some things that are excruciatingly painful that goes with our living in the Spirit. A lot of people don't believe that, but it's true. But what do we gain from it? We gain experience. What do we gain from experience? We gain hope um, and things, and then eventually wisdom. That's what I'm talking about a while ago sometimes. Wisdom is painful, but it is God's wisdom when you're exercising a spiritual way. I'm trying to answer your question. Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Well, that's obvious. To adult people, that's obvious what you're talking about. <clears throat> but then look what he said. But I speak this by permission and not a commandment. Why? Because he's not going to make a law about it. That's something sometimes adult people have to get worked out on their own. And do the best you can, but there's no law, you know. Uh, there just isn't. There are three reasons: death, desertion, and that that can be that can be defined in certain things that people do to their mates. Desertion. Sometimes you can desert somebody and move out the same house. You understand what I'm saying? And the third one, of course, adultery. Even if they've committed adultery, you don't have to divorce them. See, there's no catch-22 for us Christians. We're to seek reconciliation if we possibly, possibly can. If we can't, then what happens? Well, we go before a judge. But I honestly believe if more people knew at the get-go what it is that they're going to be getting into, actually building a family. What I said this morning is true. That is sacred. Sacred. Can you imagine two people coming together and they get a little baby? Well, that's sacred stuff to God. All right, but I speak <coughs> by permission and not by commandment. <laughs> it doesn't mean he's not going to talk about it, but you have to have some spiritual discernment. <coughs> you see what I mean? What happens to me may not happen to you. Okay? And maybe we both were divorced. But how it comes about, what's going on, how much of the spirit has been considered, how much of our Christian life is involved, non-Christians, you got non-Christians divorce each other all the time, you got Christian people divorcing. Is it God's will? No. No. Reconciliation is God's will. But does it happen? Yes. Yes, and sometimes for a variety of very valid reasons. So, you try to nip like, y'all remember Barney Fire? You try to nip it in the bud. That's what you try to do before it gets started. For I would, because there's certain things that set these things in motion. 
to certain signs. But I tell you, all men were even as myself. What, what's that mean? He ain't seen them. He ain't seen them. I have an option he was married to him. I can't prove it. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this in that manner, and another <coughs> after that. So you see, he's pointing it again to your gift. You may be, you maybe you've got the meanest, orneriest wife in America. Somebody's got to do that. There is one somewhere. So maybe that's right. Now, you take a fellow like that, that's a Christian. I'm of the uh, persuasion that God's going to give him a tremendous, tremendous amount of patience if he asks God for it. <laughs> and vice versa. If you've got some sucker that's beating on you all the time, I, I, whenever people have come to me through the years, and they ask me questions about such things as that. Now they say, well, he's beating me. I said, well, now, wait a minute. What's that got to do with marriage? Nothing. Violence. Nothing. No man has a right to that. No woman has to take that. Do I suggest to them divorce? No. But I immediately suggest to them separation. Immediately. Either talk the thing over or end it. Because that's insane, folks. Nobody's got the right to beat you women. You don't have the right to beat your husband up. He <laughs> may need it. He <laughs> may need it. But you pray and ask God to help him. And uh, But you see what I mean? I, I don't, I'm not an advocate for divorce. But if somebody's beating on somebody, I do ask them immediately separate. And start thinking, start talking, start praying. Uh, sometimes you can work through those things, and sometimes you can't. You know, you just can't. So I hope that helps. But some things I've said in general are helpful. <coughs> We're under no law. Look what it says in verse 14. For the unbelieving, or for 13, and the woman which hath a husband and believeth not, that she married her God and believed in Christ. And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Let her. See, it's, a, it's permissive language. Let her not leave him. For the unbelieving wife, his husband is sanctified by the wife. She may even bring this guy to an understanding of Christ, maybe. But not to her own peril. You know, not so he can beat her up or go out and whatever it is that he intends to do and mess up his marriage. By the wife and the unbelieving wife that's sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. In other words, children that are born inside or outside of Christ are considered a sacred thing. I told y'all, see, I'm not making this stuff up. It's sacred. It, it, it's some people, uh, they have adopted <coughs> children. That's wonderful. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. I uh, better shut up. It's your fault, man. <laughs> but I did. I, 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 I will teach on it. I'll teach on that. But when you enter in on those things, you better have an awful lot of grace. An awful lot of grace because there's an awful lot of understanding that's needed. Um, and I said, Chris, we can handle it. With the Lord, we can handle it. But we go the Lord's way. We go the Lord's way with it. Doesn't mean you're a pin cushion. Doesn't mean you're a punching bag. You go the Lord's way with it, though, and you'll, you'll come out on, on top. Terry and I were married 41 years. I knew her actually 45 years. We dated for a long time. Now, you think we didn't have to work through some stuff? Well, sure, you guys have been married for a while. You know, it takes work. It takes dedication. It takes work. It takes Love, sometimes it don't work out. But you run over my foot, I'm about ready to check it. <laughs> no, not really. One other I deserve being to have my foot run over. One other question. Uh, okay, we've got to hurry. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> now, if, if there's an uh, unbelieving husband or wife, and they're sanctified by the earth, okay, that's great. But if the unbelieving depart, mm -hmm. let him. That's right. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. That's right. Well, what's that mean? 
They, that they means, are they are married. Now the unbeliever leaves. Yeah. But their, their choice is the individual to attend that marriage. It's not for us. In other words, there's not a rule that we can all go by. The choice is up to that person. That's why it's so important for spiritual growth to happen. When you grow spiritually, you get with them. You get with them. And and I'm of the persuasion that you treat your wife better. Uh, I don't know who I was talking to today. Maybe it was Katie. I said, you know, Katie, I said, all these country and western songs where the guy's crying and bawling his wife left him if he treated her nicer and would never have to write that song. <laughs> mm. Love goes an awful long way. Let's take a little break, because that, that one I need to work with. That's an under, spiritual understanding, see. Those are more difficult. Those are more difficult, but it could be understood. It can be. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you, Brother Dave. That's good. That'll make us think. Make us think.
I set that down quick, and I was like, oh, man, I'm late again. And then uh, <laughs> uh, it's burning the whole time. I'm <laughs> sorry. I got us all. No, nah, it's my fault. Get the gas. We bad What is it, Harrison? Huh? 381, Red Foot. 381. I guess Kevin's going back. Yes, sir. He's going to go keep, back. Keeping them friends. Oh, no. 
black book. Amen. Amen. I was hoping Alyssa could come tonight. I, I had asked Peyton to sing a special one today before I did, but I guess she had some other stuff coming up. So y'all pray for her too. <coughs> Christmas is on the way, knocking on the door. Oh, and I can't wrap presents. I'm going to have to buy sacks. You know those little sack deals? Do you do that? Yes. Where are we going <laughs> So i got to buy the sacks. But anyway, it's nice that in church we have, well, I'll just read it right quick, what Paul says about this in Romans chapter 12. Just a quick thing about why it's such a blessing to be able to have other teachers and preachers in a church because it's it's how God gives us some things that we wouldn't ordinarily get. The Bible's a big book. Uh, I don't have it all. That's why I encourage everyone to testify. I encourage you to sing. If you can sing, sing. It's okay. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, you know, I mean, it'd be really good. So Romans 12 says, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And it goes on, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God. And we do that with the Bible in hand. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So there's some teaching that can be done in the Bible. That's not done by just a pastor in churches. And there's some loving to be done. 
The body of Christ works together like a, like a loaf of bread. And it's got yeast in it. I mean, and it rises and it works and it rises and it works. So Brother Danny's like the yeast. <laughs> so do we get to pound him down? You come and try, no, no. You come and preach what the Lord's laid on your heart. It's always a pleasure to me. And uh, thank the Lord. And now on Sunday evenings, if any of you men have uh, uh, something in need you'd like to do, a devotional lesson, uh, in our half hour time there, talk to me, we'll do something like that. Amen. I don't want you to feel like you're muted because you're not. Amen, brother. I pray the loaf of bread. He's going to say, I'm like the hill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as we talked about marriage a while ago, it was kind of scaring me. Kelly told me she's going to leave me if I didn't quit deer hunting so much. <laughs> I'm going to miss her. <laughs> no, she's not here tonight because she hasn't worked. You know, the Bible does say that uh, you shall find that the wife find that the good thing. Amen. So it's not, you might not be wise to go around calling your wife a thing. You know? yeah. <laughs> Kim Bowman did that one time. He got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he was talking about the Old Testament so much while ago because I'm teaching about the Old Testament this morning or this evening. Amen. You know, uh, some might say the Old Testament is to the Jews, and it was to the Jews. Some might think the Old Testament is outdated. But Father, tonight as we look at your word. Help us just to give what you'd have for us to understand out of your word tonight, Father. Just uh, bless us. Father, you have blessed us by letting us just be here tonight. We'll give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. 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 The Old Testament is to the Jews, but <clears throat> sometimes I apply what I call the goose and the gander principle. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Amen. Because after thousands of years, man has basically changed very little. Amen. Man as a whole is the same as they were thousands of years ago. If you cut somebody today that bleed, 5,000 years ago, you cut somebody that bleed. You know, somebody back, even back in the Bible days, they lived, they loved, they laughed, they cried, <coughs> just like people do today. Mm -hmm. I mean, man as a whole is basically had to change that much. I mean, you still had, still got good people and bad people all through the Bible, just like you do today. Amen. So the Bible's not outdated like some might think it is. Amen. What I'm going to teach you tonight is out of uh, Ecclesiastes. Well, the Word of God is timeless because we serve a timeless God. It was handed down from a timeless God, so you can't say His Word is outdated at any time. Amen. You remember what it said in, in Psalm 119, For thy word, O Lord, is settled in heaven forever. Not just for a little while, it's settled forever. Amen. You know, Solomon's writing to the Jews in the Old Testament. He kept, in Ecclesiastes, he kept using this phrase over and over, under the sun. He was talking about life on this planet today. He wouldn't deal with so much with tomorrow or eternity. Under the sun meant today. Today we're still under the sun. So I can say a lot of these things may still apply to us. He was dealing with life on the planet. He, very little he dealt with eternity, but he did just a little bit in chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. He touched on it for a little bit there. How, how we're heading in that direction. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, I'll start with that first. It's the writings of Solomon. He said, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not. Remember the creator in the days of thy youth, because you're not going to stay young. It don't matter what you do, you're not going to stay young. You're going to get old at some point in time. It don't matter how much you exercise or how much stuff you buy to put on your face. I read all the articles about how to stay young, the ma magazines they got about you should never take a hot shower, and you should never wash your hair while you're taking a shower because the oil from your hair might run down to your face. I read all the articles. 
the two problems I see with that is I don't pay the utility bills to take cold showers. And if I was worried about getting oil on my face, the next time Kelly says, change the oil on my pickup, I'd have to tell her, leave Seth, I might get oil on my face. <laughs> That's why he says, remember, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, for thou shalt say, I had no pleasure in them. Remember the days of, remember thy creators while you have the ability to enjoy it. And if you can start serving God at a young age, you could, you could uh, enjoy your life a whole lot better. Amen. He said, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain, before the stars and the moon and the light be darkened, that's when your daylight starts to fade. You, you notice when the day is, is about over, everything starts getting a little darker. That's when your life is. Your life will start on the waning side at some point in time. He said, before that time comes, remember that remember the Lord thy God. It's better in the days of thy youth. Because in days are going to come, the clouds return after the rain. When the clouds return after the rain, when one set of trouble is over, you go through a storm, you go through a rain. By the time one's over, you see the clouds building up, the next storm coming. <coughs> That's the way it is when you get old. It's just over and over. You got, you have one problem in life. You have uh, some kind of a, a medical problem. While you deal with that, you have high blood pressure. While you deal with that, you have something else popping up. Just one thing after another. The clouds just keep returning after the rain. That's the way it is when the when the days of your life is is darkening. In the days when the keeper of the house shall tremble, he's talking about your knees when you get old. You can't walk like you used to. Your, your legs will hold you up like you used to. Amen. The keepers of the house shall tremble. What's the... It said, and the strong man shall mold themselves. Talking about the weight of life on your shoulder. You see a lot of old men walking around all bowled over because they're carrying the weight of their life on their shoulders. And What's the riddle of the Sphinx? The Sphinx in Egypt. It has a riddle on there. It says... What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs at night? It's written in Egyptian hieroglyphics, whatever it is, but that's what the riddle is. And the answer is the life of a man. In the morning, he's a little baby crawling around on four, uh, two hands and two legs crawling around like a baby. At noon, he's a strong man walking on two feet. But in the evening, he's an old man walking with the aid of a walking stick. Hmm. He said, in the days when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few. Talking about your teeth. Hmm. Your first set of teeth fall out, they'll grow back. Your second set won't. Your second set of teeth, once they fall out, they're gone. Another yeah, one man. falls out, it's gone. Another one falls out, it's gone. Then finally they'll cease because there are few. At the time of this writing, they didn't have a dentistry where you could go get false teeth for, for outrageous prices at this time. Amen. At this time here, once you lost your teeth, they were gone. He said the grinders cease because there are few, and those that look out of the window be darkened. Talk about your eyesight. When you get old, your eyesight will start failing. They'll start getting weaker and weaker. Again, at this time, they didn't have any bifocals they could buy and wear because back then, once all these things, you know, God can keep people. When Moses was 120 years old, the Bible says his natural forces wasn't abated, nor his eyes dim. So God is able to keep people like that. But most people aren't that lucky. He said, when things that look out the windows be dark and your eyesight starts to go, and the door shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, your ears start getting weak. You can't hear like you used to. Or you get ringing in your ears, whatever it might be. That's a, that's a common thing anymore. And he shall rise up early at the voice of the bird. Old people like to get up early. That's what my Kelly granddaughter always calls me old because he, she asked me last week, she said, don't you ever sleep? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm always up when she, goes, I'm always up when she gets up. Mm -hmm. And 
he shall rise up early at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. That's talking about your voice. You can't sing like you used to. You can't, you can't sing music like you used to. Your voice starts cracking up. Amen. And when they shall be <laughs> afraid of that which is high. When you get old, you get afraid of falling down. And, the, and fear shall be in the way. You're scared of going anywhere anymore. You like to see you stay home. Because you're afraid you go somewhere, you're about to fall down. And the almond tree shall flourish. The almond tree was known for its white blossoms. Snow with white blossoms. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your white hair. Once you get old, I mean, you can die of it. An uh, old, old person with pretty hair, pretty blonde hair, really don't look right. <laughs> <laughs> and the almond tree shall flourish. In Psalms, Notice in Proverbs, we call it the hoary head. I think I'd rather call it almond tree. <laughs> and the grasshopper shall be a burden. Little things that used to didn't bother you, now they bother you. The little things. That's why you see a lot of grumpy old people. They let these little things bother them that used to didn't bother them before. Now you're armed with this knowledge. You don't have to be that way. I mean, you don't have to be a, a crotchety old person when you get old. Amen. But you do run across a lot of that way. And grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail. Desire is what he's talking about here is the desire to live, the desire of life. Sometimes it gets so bad you're just ready to give it up and mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. the desire, desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home. Why does he call it a long home? Because it's for all eternity. Once you leave this world, there's no coming back. Amen. Whether you go to heaven, whether you go to hell, that's your long home. And the mourners go about the streets. I hope they're mourning when I go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I told my grandkids and I told others, I don't want everybody to feel too sad when I, when I die, but I don't want them to be too happy either. <laughs> <laughs> And the mourners go about the streets are, and Solomon in his wisdom <coughs> was talking about death here. But he knew that old age isn't the only way to go. He went on to say, or ever the silver cord be broke or be loosened, mm -hmm. or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. The silver cord is your spinal cord. You ever you ever sever your spinal cord, you your life's over. Nowadays, you might be stuck in a wheelchair, but back then, you probably, your life was probably basically over. Or the golden bowl, talk about your skull, that's protecting your brain. If your golden bowl's ever broken, probably your life's over then. Or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, talk about your lungs, the pitcher that's holding all the blood, that circulates the blood through your body. Or the, broken, the wheel broken at the cistern, talk about the, the heart that that pumps the blood through your body. Any one of these things fail, they can kill you. It, it's not just old age. There's many ways that you can die. He said, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says Rachel, all is vanity. Sometimes seems like this whole life is just nothing but emptiness, but it's not really. I mean, he went on to say a lot of things about that, but like I said, in Ecclesiastes, he was dealing mostly with life on this planet today. He went, In this passage here, he was talking about old age and eternity. But back in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, <coughs> this is, like I said, this was to the Jews. This is Old Testament. But we're still under the sun today. Amen. So some of this stuff could apply to us. Amen. Keep thy foot when I go to the house of God. The house of God here is talking about the temple. You mean the Old Testament temple. <coughs> it's, the New Testament never calls the church the house of God. In uh, Romans, it talks about Greek Priscilla and Aquila and the church which is in their house. Mm -hmm. But it don't say the house of God, the church is in their house. And then in in uh, Colossians it talks about not plus, he said uh, 
salute him, Greek what Howard put it, and the church that is in his house. So it talks about the house. You know, the house of God in the Old Testament, remember he was talking about Joseph while ago fleeing from Esau. When he stopped that night, he had a dream. He had a dream of the ladder, the ladder set up, angel ascended and descended from heaven to earth. But when he woke up the next morning, he said, this dreadful place, this is nothing but the house of God. That place there. Then he left. When he come back again, he set up the altar and he called it El Bethel. First he called it Bethel. He said, this is Bethel. But when he come back, he called it El Bethel. Bethel meant the house of God. El Bethel means the God of the house of the God. The, the God of the house of God. Now the house of God wouldn't be much without the God present. Amen. And it's the same with the church. The church isn't really called the house of God because you know the church, this building here, it's just the place for the church to meet in. This church, this is the church house. Right. It's not the house of God. I mean, when we all leave here, God doesn't stay here waiting for us to come back. Right. When, when the last board of this building was nailed in place, this building was completed. But the church is never completed. Amen. There's always room for one more. Amen. It's like that. Uh, <coughs> That man that went to the bus driving school in New York, he was learning how to be a bus driver. He said, he asked, he said, how many people can you put on a bus? He said, the instructor told him, one more. You can always get one more on there. That's the way the church is. It's, it's, it's never completed. There's always room for one more. Amen. But it will be completed. At some point in time, somewhere, somebody's going to get saved. The, that's the last person that's going to get saved. Once that person gets saved, in the moment, in the twinkling of the night, it's going to be over. Yes, the rapture is going to take place. That salvation comes instantaneously. Once you say, I believe the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sin, I believe that. You can be saved just like that. Amen. Instantaneously. Soon as that takes place, soon as that last one is saved, you're not going to have time to say, I need to go talk to somebody. You won't have time to say, I need to go to, go to worship now. I need to go do this. You won't have time for none of that. The Bible says, the moment, the twinkling of an eye, you, you'll be changed. That's how quick something's, at some point in time, this is going to take place. A lot of people might not believe that, but it's coming. It's going to take place. At some Amen. point in time. Then he went on to say, when he said, keep that foot when I go to the house of God. Keep your foot when you go to the house of God, meaning walk reverently. Walk respectively Amen. in the house of God. I mean, when Moses saw that burning bush, and he said, I'm going to go see what, why that bush is it consumed. When he walked over, God told him, take your shoes from off your feet for the ground that I stand is on is holy ground. And the presence of God was holy ground. When uh, in Micah it says to walk humbly with your God, I mean, there's nothing wrong with coming to church and having a good time. Amen. But you don't have to be the court jester to do it. You don't have to try to get all the attention and act like a fool to do it. I mean, you can come and have a good time just like we do so many times. There was a preacher I read about one time. He went to, I think it was Ireland preaching that one of the uh, orthodox churches. Strict orthodox, what they were. And he was trying to break the ice before he started. He told a few jokes. He said, nobody even cracked a smile. So he thought all the jokes must have been a flop. But after service, he heard a couple of women talking. One of them said, that preacher was so funny, I almost laughed in church. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to be that way. In Psalms 100, look at the book of Psalms 100. Still talking about the temple, but we can we can enjoy it too. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all your land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, not we ourselves. We are the we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his 
forth with praise. Be yes. thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. All generations. His, that means his truth is still enduring now. So Amen. He said, uh, keep your foot when you walk to the house of God. Back in Ecclesiastes 5. Walk reverently, walk respectably. And then he went on to say, Be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be ready to hear when you come to the, this house. Hear what? Hear the gospel. Quite possibly you haven't heard the gospel since the last time we was here. Because you're not going to hear it on the streets. You're not going to hear it at Walmart. Amen. You might hear some on TV, but you have to be real careful what gospel you're listening to there. Because I hear so many charismatic preachers on TV, almost every one of them, they say, I've seen the dead raised. But, but if you was talking to them personally, they probably couldn't tell you nothing more than what they said right there. they seen the dead raised. I've never seen the dead raised, and probably never will. Pastor, anyway. Amen. But he said, be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. What's the sacrifice of fools? You know, in the Old Testament, they had sacrifices. One sacrifice was the burnt offering, which was totally consumed in the fire. Another sacrifice, once the offering was offered, it could be used as a meal. It could, it could be eaten. But the danger of that, they had to be careful not to make it into a festive occasion. They had to make, it was still a solemn occasion. They had to make sure it didn't turn into a festive feast. That's much like what they were doing in 1 Corinthians 11, what Paul had admonished them there. That's about what they were doing with the, with the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20, Says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For eat and every man taken before other his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. What have you not houses to eat and drink in? Despise you the church of God and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. He was admonished in them for the way they was conducting the Lord's Supper. They was thinking they was just coming together and having this big feast and that was the Lord's Supper, but they was, they was misusing it. He was telling them that's not what the Lord's Supper is. It's really a solemn occasion. You you remember what Christ done. You're looking back at what took place. It's not just to come and have a festive feast. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We have snack nights yeah. on, uh, once a month, but we have snack nights after the service. It never takes place at the service. Amen. There's nothing wrong with getting together and having a good time, having a feast. It's just the way it's carried out. You have to be careful. Everything has to be done decently and in order. That's what Paul said. Then back in Ecclesiastes, he, after he told you not to give sacrifice of fools, he said, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream coming through a multitude of business and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Mm. When you come, it's good to talk. I mean, you can talk, but just be careful. He said, uh, let your words be few. Somebody, even in a religious service, like a prayer meeting, even then, as one preacher once said, he said, if you pray for three minutes, Everybody prays with you. You pray another three minutes, everybody prays for you. You go beyond that, they start praying against you. <laughs> so even then, good one. let your words be few. <laughs> for a dream coming through a multitude of business, a dream comes through a multitude of activities. I mean, you can have a dream, you can make it come true, but if but you may have to work at it. 
You can't just sit back and expect God to do everything. I mean, he can do everything if he wanted to, but if you have a dream, sometimes he may want you to do your part in the dream to make it happen. And he said, a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Mm-hmm. The more you speak, and I heard another preacher say one time, every time you open your mouth, I can see your heart. Because Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if what's coming out of your mouth is coming out of your heart. I mean, you might be able to hide it sometimes, but sometimes it'll come out when you don't want it to. Amen. In verse, he went on to say that when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in the fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou should not vow than thou should vow and not pay. It's saying, don't come bargaining with God. Don't come to church and say, God, if you do this, I'll do this. If you'll do this, I'll be at church every Sunday. If you heal my son, I'll do this. Just don't start doing stuff like that because he said it's better not to make a vow than just make a vow and not pay it. Suffer not the mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. Neither say before the angel that it was an error. Don't say I was mistaken when I made that vow. Wherefore should God be able to hear his voice and destroy the work of thy hands? So be real careful with your words. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with coming and having a good time, and we do have good times here. But be careful with the words. Let your words be few. Because he said, God's in heaven, we're on earth. Never forget that. In the multitude of dreams and many words, are there are divers vanities, but fear thou God. In the multitude of dreams and many words, there are divers vanities. Vanities mean emptiness or are uh, unsatisfactory in a multitude of dreams there's you got a lot of different dreams you got, uh, I've known people that a lot have a lot of get rich quick schemes and I know somebody I can think of every time I talk to him he's got this other way of getting rich I always think of some way to make money but none of them seem like it ever falls through in a multitude of dreams as many words are also diverse vanity or diverse Emptiness, divers unsatisfaction, but fear thou God. Somebody once said, if you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. If you fear God for what he really is, if you knew what God really is, you could tell Satan, I'm not afraid of you because I fear God. You don't have to be afraid of God. I'm afraid of Satan. You don't have to be afraid. The Bible also said, I fear not what man can do unto me. So the Bible also said we have not the spirit of fear anymore, too. Amen. We don't have to fear God not the way they did back here. Like you were talking about earlier, God was a God of wrath in the Old Testament. And he can still be a God of wrath in the New Testament. And that time will come when all judgment will take place. Yes, sir. But we're not under that judgment right now. (coughs) When it says that it pleased God to bruise Christ, it don't mean it made God happy. It satisfied God. That's how from God's not an angry God anymore. We don't serve an angry God. His anger has been satisfied at the cross. Amen. All that anger was placed on Christ. It pleased God to bruise him. It don't mean it made him happy. It satisfied his wrath. So that's why we don't have to fear God like they did back then. In verse 8, it said, if, and verse 8 sounds so much like America today when you read it. If thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perverting of the judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. If thou see the oppression of the poor, you look around America today, you see the oppression of the poor. I mean, you can see it everywhere. They're trying to, the socialists trying to give everybody money. But if you're one of them that's, that, stuck in the cracks of war and you don't get that money they're trying to give everybody then you just you're just lost out because the more money they're giving out the higher everything's going to go and if you're not getting that money then you don't have as much money to spend on anything and they keep the, the poor oppressed that way but that's the whole idea as long as you keep the poor oppressed they don't want that they're not trying to make everybody rich they're trying to get everybody dependent Amen. Once they got you dependent on the government, then they can control you the way they want to. 
A lot of people are not seeing that, but that's what's taking place right now. You see the oppression of the poor and the violent perverting of judgment and justice, justice in a province. And you see the perverting of just, judgment and justice. You've seen all the, you've seen all the riots that was taking place last summer. <coughs> breaking in stores, just tearing out everything they want to, and nothing was being done about it. Because they got caught. Those people paying their bail, even politicians paying their paying their fines to get them out, and, and now they just turn them loose with no charges or anything like that. But then if you go out here and you uh, kill a turkey out of season, they're going to hang you for that. That's right. That's the violent the perverting of just judgment and justice. He said, when these things take place, but he said, marvel not at the matter, for the for he that is higher than the highest regarded. There is somebody higher than the highest. Amen. I mean, they might think the president is one of the most powerful, or used to think, right. that the president is the most powerful man in the world. That's what it used to be thought. But, but even back when we had the greatest president ever was, and he was carrying the most power in the world, there was somebody higher than that, that regarded what was taking place. Amen. There'd be higher than they. There's nothing higher than God. Amen. But every department you got in the government, there's one one above that. Moreover, the profit of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. It don't matter how powerful a king was, how wealthy he was, or what he had. If the field didn't produce, he'd go hungry. That's he would he would have to do without too. I mean, he might last a little longer than a lot of people would because he would be drawn off of what the people had. But if you go through a famine, the first year you might survive it all right. If the grass all die, you can live off the animals that was left. And, but after the second year, the animals all start dying off. Mm -hmm. The third year, you, you remember Ethiopia back in, back in the 80s. It didn't rain in Ethiopia for 10 years. And they had a mass exodus of all the people trying to get out. A lot of people died on the way out trying to get away. Because everybody was starving to death anyway. And I, they were showing pictures of that on the news and stuff like that. It showed that one, during that exodus, there's millions of people trying to get out of the country. This is this big water hole, and they was over dipping water out, and there was a dead body floating around in the water. Mm -hmm. I mean, at that time, they were so numb to death that they didn't bother them anymore. Mm -hmm. But the, the, prof, the, more, the prophet of the earth is for all. The Bible says that God makes it rain on the just and the unjust. And the sun shines on everybody. But he, then he goes on to say, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. He that loveth money, talk about uh, silver could be money. He that loveth money shall not be satisfied with money. When can you have enough money? Can you be like Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, and, and Zuckerberg, and Brothers. I mean, worth billions and billions. They could have spent that money if they wanted to. Bill Gates seemed like the more money he gives away, the more he's got. I mean, he's giving away billions and billions of dollars. And <coughs> does that make him a good person? No. Does that make, is he buying his way to heaven? No. He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver. How much money can you have to make you happy? He that loveth abundance would increase. Nor he that loveth abundance would increase. You won't be satisfied no matter how much you get if that's what you're trying to find to satisfy you. This is also vanity. This is also, also emptiness. This is also unsatisfactory. If that's what you're trying to find to satisfy you, money or what money can accumulate for you, he said you'll never be satisfied. When goods increase, there are, are increased that eat them. And what good is that to the owners thereof, saving them, beholding them, them with their eyes? When goods increase, it said, when goods increase, they are increased that eat them. When a person gets rich, all these other people will start coming around. Friends, family, enemies, people you don't even know. Mm -hmm. They're not coming, they're coming like buzzards to a carcass. They're not coming to protect, they're coming to devour. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants a piece of the action once, once there's something available. Mm -hmm. So the, he said, the more, the more your goods increase, the 
more you're going to have to give out to keep what you got. Then he went on to say, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. That's the cure for insomnia right there. Somebody says, I can't sleep. You get out there and work hard all day, you'll sleep. Mm -hmm. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. I mean, you work hard, you get tired, you sleep good. Whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. He's too busy worried about how he's going to keep everybody from taking what he's got. He's too worried about how he's going to make more. The, the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. This, there is a sore evil which I have seen under the sun. Talking about the life he's talking about right there. Riches kept to the owners for their hurt. I mean, you can be a miser. That's where that word misery comes from. Miser. You can keep everything you mm -hmm. make to yourself. Mm -hmm. Never share it with anybody. And go to be a lonely old man. Mm -hmm. You can live your mm -hmm. life out. You won't be well liked that way. You can you can live your life out in misery. And that's, mm -hmm. that's keeping the riches to your own hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail. And he begins the son and there is nothing in his hand. As he came forth of his mother's womb, Naked shall he return to go as he came. You got nothing, you'll take nothing. Like I said before, somebody once, when uh, John D. Rockefeller died, somebody, he was the richest man at, at the time, and somebody said, I wonder how much money he left. And somebody said, he left all of it. He didn't take nothing with him. <laughs> he shall take away nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. This is also a sore evil. That in all points as he came, so shall he go. What profit hath he that hath labored for the wind? All his days also he eateth in darkness. He has much sorrow and wrath with his sickness. Sound like life really isn't worth living when you look at it like that. Sound like you can go through the whole life and end up with nothing. And it can be that way. But in verse 18, he said, Behold that which I have seen. This is the way we should look at life. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun. All the work you do today, take time to enjoy it. Don't just waste your time. You should uh, live, You should work to live, not live to work. But I know people that do that. They spend all their time on the job and never enjoy what they have. You take time to enjoy what you got today under the sun. He said, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life which God hath given him. For it is, his, it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor, it is a gift of God. It's not a sin to be rich. There's no sin about having money. But it's, you have to be careful what you do with it. I mean, the uh, Bible says in Proverbs, the Lord he maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. You might not say that if you try to win your money through lottery or, or gambling or anything like that. There was that person on the news, it was about two months ago. He drowned in a boat accident. And in his pocket was a $45,000 winning lottery ticket. Did him not a bit of good. Then they had that one a couple years ago. He just won a million dollars and he was dead within a year. So money is not the answer to life. He said, It is good and comely for one to eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him as it is his portion. Enjoy this life. That's what he's trying to say. After all these things we talked about, and he ends with, enjoy this life under the sun, enjoy this life today. For he shall not much remember the days of his life because God answers him in the joy of his heart. You won't remember all the dark days, you can remember the good days. So Solomon talking about life under the sun today. This was thousands of years ago. But all this can still apply today because we're still under the sun. Amen. So we'll stop with that, Father, tonight, knowing that you have made us, not we ourselves, Lord, and we're just thankful that you did and that you allow us to be here tonight. Father, there's some that's not here tonight, and there's some that 
Father, we wish they could be here, but can't. And Father, we just ask that you'll watch over each one of them. Father, God, direct us through the rest of this week. Father, I'm just thankful for each one that did come out tonight. And just give them a blessing of obedience. We give you the praise of Christ's name. Amen. 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 When that happens, when edification takes place, that's what Paul said, seek the edification. You notice how marvelously quiet and gentle the Spirit of God is sometimes and just our hearts finally settle down and we can just glean from the Word of God. So he was going along there and the Lord on the cross and how the Lord took all that. We don't have to fear that. It's beautiful, beautiful thing. Sometimes just quiet down, look at some of the things. We probably got more than we need. I got from that, I've got to organize some things. I've got to, in a peaceful, quiet way, hire 17 people to help me. <laughs> no. But I, I, I want to reorganize some things, make life simpler. You know, I've seen that, I think it may be a, a ladies movement or something. Because I've seen it in a lot of homes here recently. Make it simple. Just a little thing on the wall. Make it simple. Y'all seen any of that? No, that's just me. Keep it simple. Because it can sure get real complicated, can it? But remember, this is the oasis. This is where you can come and your heart be settled and hear the word of God. Talk in such a way where it's understanding. And it's worth more than money. It's our peace of mind, our peace of heart, our families. We've got some decisions. You can make a lot better decisions with a quiet mind. A mind that's being taught by the Spirit of God. Thank you, Brother Dan. Let's stand. Uh, I'd like to see the ladies. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to meet with the ladies for a minute. That's going to be the December 27th, snack night on December 1st. And happy wedding on December 11th. Amen. I'm going to get them all lined out. we got to meet Tuesday at 2. Okay. Uh, that's not a half to the read. I just think we're going to do it. Yes. Okay. The lady from and uh, guys, y'all want to have a men's prayer breakfast? I'm going to make a. I thought we were going to do that on the 18th. 18th, yeah. 18th, 18th yeah. of December, you said. 13th. <laughs> yeah. Everybody still in agreement on it? All right. Who makes biscuits? Great big biscuits. Pillsbury. We had an idea of, of, of building a fire and cooking it outside on the pit. So you I'm can. I'm cooking over here. Can. Can. I can't cook over a pit. I have the well, video. Have to cook. Mm -hmm. now, well, I want to make a casserole. Uh, sausage, egg, and cheese casserole. Y'all, whatever you want to do, you've got the whole ground. If you want to go out there and cook them over a spit, you can. <laughs> Amen. Would you know, enjoy it and enjoy the fellowship? All right. Does that sound good that way? Good to be with y'all this evening. Good to be in the church building with the church, the body of Christ. Amen. Blessed be to the Lord. <coughs> Amen, Peyton. It's been good. All right. Are there any announcements that I've dismissed or something? Are we doing a theme for snack night or are we just going to talk about it? Snack night's December 1st, right? Mm -hmm. Right, if there's anything you want to fix. But if you want to consider making some extra dressing, 
<laughs> I love that stuff. I bet you ladies can let you dress it. I was guessing. I bet. Or anything with a raccoon in it, right? Yeah, that'd be all right. <laughs> raccoon <laughs> stew. <laughs> what do you think about this bunch of understanding? God help us. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> Amen. Katie? Uh, also, uh, for our missionary boxes, like next Sunday, um, some of the girls and ladies are going to have our list of things and okay. run down to Walmart. And, and if you ever have anything come up where you just want to talk to the old pastor, just tell me. Just tell me. I'll be glad to help you with anything I can help you with. <laughs> Pray for Brother Bill. Brother Bill's feeling better already. Y'all yeah. keep praying for him. I think he'll be all right. How is uh, Evie doing? What's the Evie report, Katie? Coughing and congestion. Really? Mom used to give me those gluten's cough drops. They're not very strong. They taste like cherries. <laughs> Luden stop drops. Y'all remember them? Am I the only one? Yeah. And yeah. that yeah. cough syrup, too. Kathy, are you feeling bad? Mm-hmm. All right, let's get out of here, guys. Okay. Amen. Ladies, back here. George, would you dismiss us, please? Lord, thank you. Oh, Heaven, we thank you for our service tonight, for being with us all this time. Show us the way you want us to go, not as go the way we want to go. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the holidays. Help us and meet it. Help us to reach them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 All God's people said, Hallelujah. for George. He wants to get on the road again. Can't wait to get on the road again. Well, I've been already making music on my friend. I can't wait to watch the whole thing. 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 It's supposed <laughs> 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 I've been making the decision not to sleep at all. I <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
If you press 